Good morning. Good to see you here, and uh, so glad that you're joining us online as well. And we are going to be in the book of Galatians, as Nick already referenced this morning. Uh, So I invite you to turn there. And then also on your way in, if you did not pick up communion cups, there are some by the door. Feel free to grab one of those whenever that may be. And uh, we will be receiving communion at the end of service. So we're going to read chapter 5 of Galatians. And uh, Nick framed in the context of what we're going to be talking about today extremely well. And so it begins like this, words from Paul to the church of Galatia. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened against by a, again by a yoke of slavery. Now, Paul's going to talk about a topic which we're not going to talk about today. I'm going to read about this, but this is not the topic we're talking about, all right? There's other things we've got concern about that we need to talk about. So, so just think of the framework here. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So this is a conversation that's going on in Paul's day about can you follow Jesus and do this or no, yes, you have to, or no, you can't. There's There's conversations that have happened like this for 2,000 plus years. Again, I declare to every man that who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Verse 4, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For though through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In the case that of offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would just go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So Paul is pretty passionate here about this comment there. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Some sort of relevance to our times we live in. Verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. So as you're well aware of today, it is July 4th. It is the day our country celebrates its independence and its birth as a nation. In 1776, 245 years ago, our country had the first taste of freedom. There was a desire of freedom. There was a hope of freedom, but it had its first taste. About 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, In 1892, the Pledge of Allegiance was written. And the last half of the pledge says this, which you well know. One nation under God, indivisible, 
with liberty and justice for all. And throughout the history of this country, there has been this search, this drive for liberty, for justice, and for freedom. Some have experienced the full extent of liberty and justice and freedom, and others to this day still fight for liberty, justice, and freedom. See, this is something that is not just an American value. This is a humanity, a value of humanity. It is a value that all humans have because we're created in God's image. With what Paul is saying here is for freedom that Christ has set us free and not to be burdened by a yoke of slavery. These are values that are much deeper than just American or Western ideals. See, this drive for freedom is rooted in this deep place. It's what it means to be a human. It's what it means to be made in the image of God. The Apostle Paul, he had the same drive as he wrote this, the same call for freedom. And the Apostle Paul was known as Saul. His job was to kill Christians. I mean, he was doing what he thought was right. He was, he was searching for a way of freedom, but he found it in one of the most unexpected places, that being in Jesus. And I think the story of Saul becoming Paul, of Paul's uh, journey, is a hope-filled reality no matter who we are or where we're at. I mean, if you're here today and you're praying for someone that they would come to know Jesus, that loved one, that friend, there's a Saul to Paul prayer. If you're here today and you're trying to figure out what does it mean, this Jesus thing and this church thing, and what does it mean to follow Jesus, you can find Jesus in unexpected places like Saul did and how Jesus transformed him into Paul. This freedom in the most unexpected places. Paul should be this beacon of hope. As he writes, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. There's great hope in that. This hope that comes from Jesus, true freedom. But Paul also said something else in these early verses. He says, do not let yourselves be burdened against a yoke of slavery. So we look at freedom, and and really the other option is slavery. Freedom in Christ or slavery to anything else. This is really the path of what it means to be human. Author David Foster Wallace, who was not a proclaimed follower of Jesus, he agreed with Paul that we either exist in this freedom found in what he called a spiritual being, which you'll see here in just a moment, or in slavery. He wrote these words. He says, in the day-to-day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only reason, the only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type of thing, whether it be Jesus Christ or Allah or it be Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truths or some other inevitable set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know that this stuff, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping up, keeping the truth in front of daily consciousness. Worship power, and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. You will need even more power over others to numb your own fear. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful, it's just that they're unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship that you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more, more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that's what you're doing. We all worship something. We worship God and we find freedom through Christ or we become enslaved to any of these things that he just mentioned or other things that control us in our life. We're wired to worship. 
And I think we can quickly identify what we worship, if you don't know it already, by considering how do I use my time? How do I use my money? What are my thoughts consumed upon? I mean, if you had to write down, look at your, 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 your checking account, look at your bank account, look at your time allocation in the last week, you could say, this is what I worship. This is it. What we think will bring us freedom by what we buy, what we think upon, what we do, can often enslave us. There's a professor who said, our strongest desire is not our deepest desire. Some of you need to write this down right now and like post it somewhere where you see it every day. Our strongest desire is not our deepest desire. And often, our deepest desires are sabotaged by the strongest desires. For example, if I was up here and I had a brownies in a bowl just overflowing and ice cream and whipped cream and just all the toppings, Corey would be all on top of it. None of you would get any of it. So if this bowl was here, most of you, not all of you, you'd be like, I'm there. I'm there. If I had a plate of carrots here, you're like, no, no, thank you. See, see, our strongest desire is probably the brownies and the ice cream. But our deepest desire is health and well-being. Right? Does this make sense? But we sabotage our health and well-being by eating the brownies and the ice cream. Our strongest desire is not our deepest desire. This is why there's great danger in current ideologies of be true to yourself. Just live your own truth. Do as you feel is best. There's great danger because, again, our strongest desire is not our deepest desire. Our strong desires control us. They enslave us. Our deepest desires can be sabotaged by that immediate moment. It's what we call temptation. And modern ideologies say that true freedom is do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt another person. Enjoy, pursue, look at, take, buy, feel, whatever it is. And so we look at freedom today as this opposite of restraint. What freedom is today is whatever I want without restraint. And this didn't start today or with this generation or the previous generation. This started a long time ago and started unfolding the opposite of restraint. And any restraint, whether it's a parent, authority, God, Bible, is viewed as negative because it's a restraint on freedom. However, freedom without restraint is dangerous. Freedom without restraint is dangerous. And this is not just because the Bible says of it. Think of driving. Well, I feel like driving on the other side of the road. You can't restrain me. I feel like cutting across this yard. You can't restrain me. I am free. Paul said, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but freedom without restraint results in chaos and destruction personally and for other people. Because the do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else is one of the biggest fallacies because it does hurt other people. Brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, Paul said. The way of Jesus is a way of freedom, but there is also restraint, and this restraint keeps us from sin, which this restraint is a built-in guardrail system to help us walk the godly way of life. Parents, we teach our kids the way to go. My, my nephew's making some, some noise back there reading a book. Now, my sister and brother-in-law are going to teach him the way he should go. They're going to put guardrails around him. They do it now just as a baby. Not because they're mean and restrictive, but because they love him. They give him freedom, but there's restraint. And it's an act of love that God gives us freedom, but says not to be burdened by a yoke of slavery. 
See, freedom is really freedom from sin to follow Jesus. True freedom is freedom from sin to follow Jesus. And so what I want to do is with our remaining few minutes is I want to give you three words. And they're big, churchy, theological type of words that you've heard before and you probably haven't used in a really long time. But I want to use these three words to paint a picture of what true freedom looks like and the very practical realities of these three words. Okay, so these are the three words, and we're going to come back to them. They're going to be on the screen, so here they are. They're justification, sanctification, glorification. Now, you may be looking at your watch going like, are you serious? You're going to talk about these three things in like the next 15 minutes? Yeah, we're going to go about that deep into them. So we're going to give this overview, and then you study away. So first thing, justification is freedom from sin's penalty. Justification is freedom from sin's penalty. Sin's penalty is death. We're born sinful. The result will be death unless something is done about that. It's eternal separation from God. It is the worst possible thing that I can think of. Justification is the act by which God moves on a person. A person responds to the calling of God and moves them from a state of sin to a state of grace and righteousness. See, Jesus' death on the cross paved the way for this to unfold. It's this payment for our sin. It's God pardoning and forgiving sin. And so when God looks at me, he doesn't see me as righteous. He sees me through the lens of Jesus as righteous, what Jesus did for me. And justification is freedom from sin's penalty. It's because of what Jesus did. A passage like Romans 3 says this, this righteousness, this right standing with God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. The justification happens when the sinner puts his or her trust in Jesus. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians. God made him, being Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So again, God no longer sees our sin. He sees Jesus as the one who's taken our sin upon himself. There's another passage in, in Romans chapter 5, verses 16 through 19 that you can look up later. Romans chapter 5, verses 16 through 19 that paints this picture about the gift of God. So because of Jesus, we are justified and we're free from sin's penalty. There was penalty because of our sin, but because of what Jesus did in belief in Jesus, that we're justified in the eyes of God. So that's the first part of freedom from sin. That's something that happened. Jesus went to the cross 2,000 years ago, and at any point, we can say, yes, I believe in Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. I want to walk with you. Second thing is sanctification is freedom from sin's power. So justification is freedom from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is freedom from the power of sin. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, I do not understand what I do. He is just lamenting in this verse. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, I, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Paul is just going like, I want to follow God, but I keep doing that thing. I keep sinning again again and again. Have you been there? It's frustrating. It's debilitating. It causes you to question a lot of things. Paul's like, I don't want to do this, but I keep doing this. In another letter, Paul says this. He says, like the result of figuring it out. So I say, walk by the Spirit, what we read earlier, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. But he's like, I was doing these things I didn't want to do, but now he's saying, I figured this out. If I walk by the Spirit, I'm not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you are not to do whatever you want. We don't like that last line as Americans, and do what I want to do. 
Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's walking by the flesh. Walk by the Spirit. You're not to do whatever you want to do, but we follow the Spirit. Because the Spirit and the flesh are at war with one another. And sin is powerful. It is powerful. But the power of Jesus is far greater than the power of sin. When that temptation comes upon you, when you are in the middle of sin, the power of Jesus is far greater than that temptation, far greater than that sin. Even if you're in the middle of it right now and you don't think there's a way out. Sanctification is God's renewing work, transforming our minds and our wills and our affections and our behaviors. This is an ongoing work in our life. So sanctification is, is God's power in us by the Spirit transforming the way we think, the things we say, what we do. This is sanctification. It's participating with God. It's not just God, help me defeat this sin. All right, God, do it. It is participating with God. God is faithful. He will walk. He will give you ways out. But it's us participating with him in these forming of habits and affections and attitudes. Really what it is, is it's like this counteraction to sin because sin is around us. It's like this pushing back, this restraining, this holding back and this sanctification because of the work that, that Jesus is doing in us, the Spirit's doing in us. Temptation comes and it's like, nope, I'm learning to say no to this. I'm learning to walk away from this. The sanctification is this process that happens as we walk with Jesus. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 7, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. <clears throat> let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates. It's a sanctification that's going on. And Paul, he contrasts the flesh and the spirit. The, the battle that's going on, he contrasts that in what we read this morning in Galatians 5, right? Because he said this, he said, if the flesh is ruling, if, if it's just taking over, it's, you're going to see these things in you and around you, in, like in your life. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm not in the middle of all those things. It's not the point. These things grow in us when we're... Leaning into the flesh. But he says, but, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is this. This is how we know that the sanctification process is going on, that we're drawing near to God, that God is active within us. These things are being born in our life. Love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's the flesh and the Spirit at war. Sanctification is a process that goes on as we walk with Jesus. Salvation is the justification part, the forgiveness of sin. Sanctification is the walking it out. It's becoming like Jesus. It's the, it's the becoming a disciple, following him. So justification, no longer the sin of penalty because it occurred at salvation. Sanctification, the power of sin is reduced in our life. It's this ongoing process. And then the third and the final word is glorification. Glorification is freedom from sin's presence. The air of the church, the air of Christians, the air of much teaching is, Jesus, forgive me from sin's penalty, number one. Let's just skip this part. Let's go to heaven. Let's, let's be free from sin's presence. If you're with me today, we're not here yet. We're here. If you know Jesus, you're here. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is what you're considering up here. You know Jesus, it's just freeing from sin's power. This is yet to come. This is eternity. This is, there'll be no more tears, no more mourning, no more pain, no more brokenness. This is eternity. Gerald Bray said this, the glorification of the Christian is that we shall share in God's glory when we are in our resurrected bodies in a new heaven and a new earth. 
experiencing deeper fellowship with God and not being at all risk of falling away into sin, God's glory finally being all in all. Or as it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, and we shall see him as he is. Or in Colossians, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ. Or in 2 Peter, though he's given us these very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. This is this future reality. It's reality of being with Jesus in this eternal state. So, quick review. I think we did it. We did it. We did it even in like 10 to, 10 to 11 minutes. We talked through those three. Again, this deep. So think of this again, justification. We can be assured because of justification. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have asked him to forgive your sin, if you have admitted that you are a sinner, that you need a Savior, that you need a Lord, someone to follow, you need Jesus to follow, to be guided by the Holy Spirit, we can be assured that we are free from the penalty of sin, eternity apart from God. We can also, if we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, we can be patient in sanctification. Many of you, if not all of you, are probably frustrated many times. of like, oh, I thought, I thought we had this worked out. Oh, the sin is just pushing back again. Oh, I, thought, I thought we dealt with this. Kind of like how I think of Paul as a thorn in his side, whatever that was. I thought we dealt with this is that when it comes to sanctification, you can be patient because it is a walk with Jesus. It is not a perfection with Jesus. That's the third thing. It's a walk with Jesus. And that doesn't justify sin that you're willingly committing, but it's a walk that Jesus is like, come on, let's, let's do this again. Let's do this again, come on. I love you. That we, when we fall down, my youth pastor told me all the time, the definition of a true follower of Jesus is one who falls down but gets back up one more time. That we just get back up and we're like, all right, God, I confess this is sin. God, change me. Make me more like you. I don't want to do this again. I want to follow after you. I want to be like you. I want my thoughts to be like you, my actions, my words, to be like you, Jesus. Continue to do the work in me. God, thank you that you are patient with me. Help me to be patient with myself. Some of you need to embrace that. So we walk with Jesus, being freed from the power of sin. And then the third thing is we, we look ahead to glorification. That one day we will be free from the presence of sin. And as the song says, oh, what a day that will be. That we're free from the presence of sin. So, okay, Johnny, would you put up the, the list, the one, two, three, of the, the, the three statements there um, one more time? Thank you. So if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is, this is what you're, you're wrestling with, you're contemplating right now, is that, is that do I desire this freedom? Is God calling me this freedom from sin's penalty? Because right now my path in eternity is not with Jesus. So you wrestle with this, is that, the confession of sin. And it begins with just saying something like this. And you can do it even right now. It's just, is God, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I've, I've, I've sinned against you. Jesus, it's because of your work on the cross that you are taking my sin, all that I've done. You're freeing me from the penalty of sin Eternity separated from you. In this moment, God, in this confession of sin, I receive your forgiveness. Wash me just white as snow. Forgive me of my past. God, I trust you. 
I don't understand it all. I don't know what it means, but God, I trust you and I confess you as my savior today. And if you're here today and you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're, we're looking at number two is this sanctification is freedom from sin's power. Temptation is a reality. Temptation will always be there in this reality that we know. And so today, your prayer, your heart's desire is something like this, is, is Jesus, you save me from the penalty of sin. Now, Jesus, work it out in my life to save me from the power of sin around me. God, I recognize the temptation in whatever area it is that you're tempted or you're in the middle of the choices you're making, the things you're saying, the things you're doing, that you confess that right now. You just confess whatever that sin is. Confess the the power, the stronghold that it has in your life. Just confess that to God right now. And God, you've heard the prayers of those who are gathered in this place, those who are watching at home right now, on the road, wherever they may be. Jesus, thank you that your spirit sets us free from the power of sin. And Lord, all of us who know you as Lord and Savior, who follow after you, we look forward one day, not done with us here, we look forward to it one day, this glorification, this freedom from the presence of sin. For it is by freedom that Christ has set us free. Lord Jesus, help us to stand firm, not to be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Jesus, I pray that for those who just prayed to receive Jesus for the first time now, they wouldn't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. For those of us that have been following Jesus for whatever length of time, that we also would stand firm and not be burdened by the the yoke of slavery, that we would walk in the freedom that you offer. And Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the freedom that you bring. And so Jesus, we we trust you in this moment. We love you. And we pray this all in Jesus' strong and powerful name. Amen. One of the traditions, um, I shouldn't even say tradition, one of the things that Jesus started and became a tradition within the church was that of the Lord's Supper or communion or Eucharist or whatever you, you so choose to call it. But what it is, is it's a remembrance of the work that Jesus did on the cross, the power of salvation. Um, we're just so thankful that we can participate in in the Lord's Supper. And so as you prepare the bread as the symbol of Jesus's broken body, as you prepare the juice, the symbol of um, uh, the blood poured out, we take a moment. The scripture says that when they had given thanks, this took place. And so would you pause for a moment and would you give thanks As we think of salvation, would you give thanks um, to God for your salvation if you know him as Lord and Savior? And then I'll lead us through communion. Scripture records that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take and eat? Scripture continues by saying, in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you take a drink? (laughs) 
So Jesus, on this day that our country remembers independence, thinks on freedom and liberty and justice, Jesus, I pray that we would be people who walk in freedom because of you. Freedom from slavery of sin, slavery of things, but that we exist because of you and for you. Spirit, guide us today. Direct us today. Lord, I pray that we would be a, a people who are about you, a people who share you, people who are intentional about those around us. God, a people who have experienced freedom and that want others to experience freedom as well. And Lord, I thank you that you came to us in a very humble, servant-focused, loving mode and method. God, I pray that we, too, would embody the ways of Jesus as we walk with others, as we share you with others. Lord, send us from this place, and may we be about the things that you call us to. We're so thankful that we can gather this morning. We pray your blessing upon the rest of the day for each person who hears these words. We pray this in Jesus' strong and powerful name.